can only wonder at every gift you send, at blessings without number, and mercies without end. We lift our hearts before you and wait upon your word. We Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in, in the, the highest Christ, and, and on earth peace to people of the will. We, we praise you. We, we bless you. you. We, we adore you. We, we glorify you. you. We, we give you thanks, thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Look upon us, O God, creator and ruler of all things, and that we may feel the working of your mercy. Grant that we may serve you with all our heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once to your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshiping it, sacrificing to it and crying out, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I see how stiff-necked this people is, continued the Lord to Moses. Let me alone then, that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people? 
whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with such great power and with so strong a hand. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I am grateful to him who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to this ministry. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, and I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. Indeed, the grace of our Lord has been abundant, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am the foremost. But for that reason, I was mercifully treated so that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the King of ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord.
with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors <clears throat> and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having 10 coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, a man had two sons, and the younger said to the father, Father, give me the share of your estate that you should come to me, that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine, and he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, but here am I dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fatted calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because his, this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father gave, came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fatted calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead <clears throat> and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord.
many names have been given to this parable or these series of parables, but I, with respect to the last one, I consider it the parable of the errant heart. But whose exactly is it? Whose heart is it that is wrong, that is in error? Is it the son's heart or is it the brother's heart? Is it the Pharisee's heart or is it the crowd's heart? And I think the answer is that each of them errs in its own way. And the only way to measure the deviation from perfection is to know what is in the Father's heart, God the Father's heart, which is to say to know the Father's perfect desire for us, our Heavenly Father's perfect will for each of us, each son, daughter, <coughs> child of God. What is it God's desire for me, for you? And there is no one better qualified to reveal the secret perfect desire of God the Father than God the Son. And that is exactly what Jesus does. Jesus reveals through these three parables, he links them together, or I should say at least Luke linked them together, but there's no reason not to believe Jesus spoke them in unity. All three are linked together to make it clear that God is just, God is merciful, but God is also very, very loving. Which is to say that in God, there is a manifestation of an embracing love. Can we even say an emotive love? A love that is beyond simply principled ideas and a love that has feeling and simply reflects, or we should say our love, can be a reflection of that love that is God's. Is it not reasonable that, to conclude that we who are created in the image of God, who have feelings of love, and we do have principled love, we do things that we don't necessarily want to do, but we do them because it's in the best interest of this person or that person, but we also have emotions, we have feelings, we have that, that, that sense inside of us that, that exudes a desire to be with that other person, that love, And if we are created in the image of God, is it unreasonable to think the God who gave us that doesn't understand it? Yes, but in a perfect way, in a way that is beyond even sometimes our ability to understand. Sacred scripture is just filled with references to God's love for us. This imagery that communicates this aspect of God, the divine majesty, a full range of emotion. And we find that all the way from anger to complete tender affection and devotion. Always perfectly ordered, always perfectly controlled, as we heard in the story of Moses. But in contrast to human emotions, we who are human, who have emotion as well, are not always able to, to, able to keep it ordered, to keep it directed in a way that is right. Through these pre three parables, it is as if Jesus conveys to us an insight into God and God's mercy. It is an, it is an insight that, that precedes our Lord's life on earth and is expressed in the Psalms and in one in particular, Psalm 78 or 79, depending on how you number the Psalms, it is says, may your mercy outweigh our sins. On that scale, <laughs> the sins are down here, but the mercy is way high, way greater. 
Certainly that is the prayer unspoken that the prodigal son speaks in his heart. I know that my father, I know that my father will have some measure of mercy. I don't deserve much, I don't deserve anything, but I know who he is. You see, God is just, but he is also merciful, and he is also compassionate, which is to say that God is loving, loving in that sense that we understand that love is. That deep and abiding affection for another human being, that you would give your very life for them. Because God always desires what is good for us. God always desires what is best for us, both in that temporal sense of life now and happiness now, but also in the eternal sense of everlasting life and everlasting happiness. And so a divine balance connects divine justice with divine mercy and divine love. And there is a complementary whole, a unity that contains all three. To separate one aspect or one part and to overemphasize one aspect without taking into consider the other two distorts the entirety of God. For God is complete justice, complete mercy, and complete love. And that is the error of the Pharisee, or the Pharisee type, the image that give, is given to us in the New Testament, in the Gospels, of that person who is always looking to nitpick. It captures the idea of that person whose overemphasis is on justice or punishment, usually, and whose viewpoint is always rather concrete. It's either right or it's wrong. This one is quick to tattoo, as it were, the word sinner <laughs> across the chest of that one who he has deemed as a sinner and tattoo with indelible ink a word that can never be erased. The crowd, on the other hand, are eager to hear Jesus' words because they are the ones who have received the tattoo. <laughs> they are the ones who have been designated as the sinners. And the Pharisee types have come to believe that those sinners, those ones over there, can simply not, that, 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 that tattoo, as it were, cannot be removed. They never challenge the assumption because they don't know God's love. They stigmatize people and they label them and they place them in a box. And then along comes Jesus, who says, you know, you're both wrong. <laughs> you Pharisees are wrong because you overemphasize the problem or the need for justice and punishment. And you sinners over there, you are also wrong because you don't understand the beauty and wonder of God's love for you, which is why I am standing here before you. The new image that Jesus provides, and that is why the crowds are drawn to him, is the image of the Father in this parable, who is to, course, to represent God the Father, whom we profess to believe in the creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. This is the God that we profess belief in, and he is ever watchful, ever watchful for the Son's return. And that return, when in the parable, when, when the boy gets up and says, you know, this, this isn't working. <laughs> and I, I gotta go back, I gotta go back to my origins and start again. That very act, of reversal is in its own right an act of contrition. But it is also accompanied by words of contrition. When he says, Father, I, I have sinned against you, I have sinned against heaven, and I am not even worthy to be called your son. 
give me a job so I can at least eat. And in that moment, the forgiveness just flows out immediately, immediately communicated in the symbol of the robe and the ring. As with the lost coin, there just has to be a party. We have to rejoice. We have to be excited because something that was dead and gone is back and alive. This is God with feeling, with notion, with compassion. This image of the father in the parable is not some remote, uh, disconnected uh, old fella standing on the side of the road. This one embraces the son, and every artistic imagery of, of this moment, this parable, which is painted so many times, always tries to convey that deep compassion and love and joy because the son that was dead is alive. <clears throat> this is God who loves. Oh, well, there's justice. Don't doubt that there's justice. For this, in the parable, this prodigal son has in fact spent his whole inheritance. His wealth, his material wealth is gone in the parable. And he has to now live for the rest of his life with the consequences of those actions. They don't go away. And he's got to live with an older, or another, I don't know if he's older brother. Anyway, the other brother who doesn't like him <laughs> and probably isn't going to like him <laughs> because he's messed up the whole family estate. He has to live with the bad choices that he made. And that's a great satisfaction to all the Pharisee types. But it's fairly minor when you put it in comparison to the attainment of a treasure now that he has received. He has regained that love and relationship which Jesus is telling us is the relationship with God the Father. And he has that love literally placed on him by the robe. <clears throat> it is a restored connection to his father in the parable, which Jesus points out. He is giving this, and he is providing this to the crowds, to the people who have been stigmatized. He, Jesus does this through his words, these words of hope, these parables, but he is also going to do it in the most profound and definitive way by his own sacrifice on the cross. There is no greater expression of love than the supreme love of God, the Son who gives himself in love on the cross for us. Mankind will never receive a gift greater than that. You see, we receive that gift when through faith we believe and understand its effectualness for us, that it has restored and given to us life, but not just life, life, but life that is love, that is God. Jesus' entire gospel is a proclamation of repentance. He begins the gospels with those words. Jesus went around and said, repent for this kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel is a proclamation of repentance from sin. It is a proclamation that invites people to turn to God and receive the robe of love, which is that love of forgiveness and compassion, but also to receive that ring, which always symbolized, symbolized in antiquity the particular connection one held to a family and the status that one held in that family. Very important, very important symbol. And we receive that ring in baptism and in forgiveness 
and through penance and through the sacrament of reconciliation, as that relationship is restored and we be, become and continue to be members of God's household, for we are sons and daughters, we are brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God Almighty, brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. The truth that these three parables convey is nothing short of amazing, stunning. Because not only is God loving, but now he actively seeks us out and wants that relationship. It is the shepherd, that image of the one who leaves, leaves the 99 for the, for the lost lamb. A lamb is just, I mean, it's, I mean, it's insignificant, right? We'll get more next year, don't worry about it. But it is precious to God. And that is how we have to understand ourselves and everyone who is separated from God. Because God loves that one who is separated as much as he loves us who are united to him. And so like Jesus, our desire should always be weighted toward repentance and a return of the sinner because it is what God desires. Our desire should be what God's desire is. And that is why the Son of God came to earth and why he came in human form. And that is our desire as well. It is the reason he suffered and he died on the cross. It is the central truth that we celebrate at every Mass, that we remember at every Mass, and that we pray are inspired at every Mass because it demonstrates that profound and unending love that God has and seeks to draw us to him if we simply will respond. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, to God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. To offer to God our prayers of thanksgiving and of petition. That our parish community may be a place of mercy and compassion for those who feel lost, abandoned, burdened by guilt, and in need of experiencing God's unconditional love, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have neglected the sacrament of penance will rediscover confession as a tremendous source of freedom, comfort, and peace that only Jesus can give. May humility lead us all to allow him 
to wash us in the ocean of his mercy, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. prayer. That those whose journey through life is marked by illness, suffering, grief, and despair may find in us support, consolation, and hope, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all the faithful departed, especially Shaheen Michaels, for whom this holy mass is offered, may through the mercy of God rest in peace, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the needs of one another and for all who have asked for our prayers, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we offer these prayers to you with love and ask that you receive them in love and grant those things that we ask in accord with your will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Please join together in singing number 616, Tend the Ground. That's number 616. Brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands, the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Look with favor on our supplications, O Lord, and in your kindness accept these your servants' offerings, that what each has offered to the honor of your name may serve the salvation of all, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For through his paschal mystery, he accomplished the marvelous deed by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession, to proclaim everywhere your mighty works, for you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy
indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and in giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Peter, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
Savior command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word. Number 366, number 366.
Let us pray. May the working of this heavenly gift, O oh Lord, we pray, take possession of our minds and bodies so that its effects and not our own desires may always prevail in us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, before Mass, um, I was not able to um, hear all the confessions that uh, had presented themselves, so I will hear confessions afterwards. And I think it's raining out, so <laughs> I think we will go inward into the... I don't know what we're doing. Anyway, I have to, I'm going to take my vestments off, and then I'll go out to the confessional. Okay. The Lord be with you. And with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God. Please join in singing number 476, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. That's number 476. Mm -hmm. 